is Stand Up For The Truth, addressing important issues and topics affecting Christians across the nation. Crash Connell in the building along with Mary Danielson. It is Tuesday, May 21, 2024. It is a brand new podcast. One of our favorite guests is back. Yes. With this book here. Yeah. And lots to talk about, Mary Danielson. Yes. Good morning. J.B. Hickson is with us today, and we're going to be talking about uh, prophecy and other such trends in this old, weary world, another day to serve the Lord and talk about truth. But first, I just want to make mention of the deaths of the Iranian officials over the weekend. And front, uh, Jerusalem Post had an interesting quote, because the first thing that came to my mind was, were they involved, I don't even know if I need to ask that, in October 7th? And um, J. Post has a great uh, paragraph here. Whether Raisi knew the date of the attack probably is not important. <laughs> I don't know if we're talking plausible deniability with uh, a leader of Iran. But anyway, Iranian Foreign Minister Hossein Amir Abdullahian was in constant contact with the Hamas leadership before and after the attack. Iran's hand was clearly involved. Uh, Abdullahian uh, died in the helicopter with Raisi. Very, very interesting. Um, God certainly knows about these things. But then uh, front page mag, and this is an article I do want to recommend um, very much to talk about uh, who these gentlemen were, who Raisi was, and um, uh, it's called The Butcher of Tehran Meets a Mountain, and that's a reference to the mountain coming to Muhammad or Muhammad coming to the mountain, which I thought was an interesting uh, thought on his part there. But it says, um, the Islamic Revolution in Iran had brought many monsters to power, Raisi among them, one of the Islamic uh, student radicals who turned a nation with freedom and civil rights into a ruthless Islamic theocracy. He also represented the last generation of the revolution. Still in his early 60s, it was expected he would usher in the next era of the Islamic Revolution. Now listen to this. Within weeks of Iran's likely arrival at a nuclear threshold, Raisi went down in a Bell helicopter that the United States had exported to Iran back in the era of the Shah. Iran had spent billions on nukes, ballistic missiles, and drones, but neglected to invest in developing its own civilian aircraft. While the price of putting guns ahead of butter is usually paid by civilians, it was the butcher of Iran and his entourage, including Iran's foreign minister, who paid the price for their murderous obsession with nuclear weapons with their lives. So that's just one very short take on all of that. I um, encourage you to do your homework on that. But uh, God certainly knows. God is in charge. And um, wow, incredible, incredible story. So frontpagemag.com and look for The Butcher of Tehran Meets a Mountain. Great article. All right, scripture today, Titus 2, 11 to 14, which says, For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us that Denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. One of my favorite passages. Let's pray this morning. Please pray with me. Lord, we know that this world has an appointment with you, a time for an accounting of what was done under the sun. And we praise and thank you that you are a God of justice in a world that cares nothing for truth and equity. Thank you that nothing is hidden from your view and you never change. Lord, we long for the day that you rule in righteousness. And uh, Lord, in all of our busyness, please remind us of the lateness of the hour and the need to bring the gospel to those who are perishing and, op and for open doors to do just that as we see the day approaching. We lift up JB to you. Uh, for his labors for the kingdom, Lord, bless his travels, his time in the pulpit, um, to continue to point people to the kingdom to come, making the most of every opportunity. Bless him and his loved ones with good health and endurance in all situations. Refresh his soul, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. J.B. Hickson, back with us, author, podcaster, and pastor, well-versed in all things related to prophecy and all the challenges to our faith in these times. He's a pastor at Plung. Plum Creek Chapel in Sedalia, Colorado, president of Not By Works Ministries, which is notbyworks.org, also an app, a great app you can get in your app store. Uh, books, Spirit of the Antichrist, Volume 1 and 2, Spirit of the False Prophet. And I do, again, highly recommend these resources because they really do pull the curtain back 
on the dark agenda of the enemy of our souls. They can help ramp up our discernment. Um, they, a lot of books of that nature have an expiration date because things change so quickly. These do not. These are great resources. JB, welcome back to Stand Up. Hey, Mary, great to be with you. Always love uh, talking uh, with a, a fellow conspiracy <laughs> factist. <laughs> and general history and prophecy nerd. <laughs> uh, amen. That's right. You know your stuff. Let me tell you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, this is this is always just such a treat. Uh, and it is still travel season for you. I think one of the last times we chatted, you mentioned you were entering your travel season. And next on your schedule is the Mid-America Prophecy Conference this weekend in Tulsa. Tell us about that. You're going to be there. And who else is going to be there? Uh, what can you tell us about that event? Yeah, that's uh, May 24th and 25th, so this Friday and Saturday uh, in Tulsa. It's an annual event. It's been going on, well, for well over 20 years now. Uh, and uh, Dr. Andy Woods will be there, myself, several other speakers. Uh, I'll be speaking twice. I think Andy's speaking twice. Uh, and it's just a uh, just a, a power-packed lineup, and we're really excited about, uh, about being there. It's one of my favorite conferences of the year. So, yeah, not too late. You can get tickets at the door. They've got plenty of space. It's a huge uh, ballroom at the Marriott Hotel there, uh, so no worries uh, about, uh, about getting a ticket. Uh, but come on by if you're in the area. We'd love to see you. Great. Yes, the Mid-America Prophecy Conference. Uh, I go on their page. It's BibleProphecyAsWritten.com, and they, they mention that people often plan their vacations around this uh, event. They enjoy it so much year after year, so it sounds like yeah. a fantastic time. And, and folks folks can, can get to it from our website and app as well. Just go to the Events okay. tab at the NBW Ministries app, and it'll link you right there to all the details. Okay, sounds good. Do they Do they stream the event? They don't stream it, okay. uh, but they will make the the uh, sessions available at some point after the conference to okay. the general public, but it's not streamed. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Now, you have two topics, uh, two sessions at this conference, and I want to look at these topics this morning, at least overview them in the time that we have, give people an idea of what you're going to be teaching on. Uh, first one is False Gospels and the Christian Industrial Complex in the Last Days. Oh, I can't wait to dig into this, JB. And the New World Order Timetable 2025 and the Blueprint for Global Tyranny. So I just want to jump right into that first one about false gospels. Now, I, I tend to think that apostasy is largely an outward symptom of a low view of the scriptures uh, because the Bible says they will not endure sound doctrine, and then there's a lot of mischief that follows after that. But especially, J.B., the Old Testament, which occasionally I will hear that some evangelical pastor has said they're just not going to teach that anymore, and I can't even venture a guess as to why. So I'm going to ask you, what's up with that picking and choosing mindset an entire an entire testament isn't worthy of their time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mention that, because in my presentation on— uh, the Christian industrial complex, the very first uh, thing I'm going to address right out of the chute as examples of apostasy in our in these great last days uh, are attacks on the Word of God mm -hmm. and how otherwise mainstream you know evangelical leaders that uh, many people look up to, uh, they're just coming right out and boldly saying, look, we don't we don't look to the Bible anymore as our standard. We think the Bible has errors. It's not reliable. Uh, and, you know, it's it's they're pulling the rug out from under the entire foundation, mm -hmm. not only of the gospel, but of Christian living. And uh, it's it's really sad. Uh, we've got several examples that I'm going to be giving at the conference uh, that uh, really even made me uh, shudder. And, you know, I, I'm used to looking behind the curtain. This has yeah. been a, a journey of ours for 15 or 20 years now, going down the rabbit hole of, of the Luciferian conspiracy, as as the Bible talks about. Uh, but boy, some of these things, it's it's hard to believe. And we can go into some examples if you'd like. Yeah, absolutely. Um, do you want to talk about the false gospels first, or do you want to define these Christian industrial complex? I can go either way. Yeah, that's a good idea. Let's define the Christian okay. industrial complex. So essentially, that's a, a phrase that uh, I think I've, a friend of mine, uh, Russ Miller, who I know you've had on the show, yeah. first used. Uh, and I loved the phrase, and so I, I asked him, hey, can I borrow that phrase as a title? <laughs> and he said, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And so I've kind of massaged it a little bit. And what I mean by the Christian industrial complex is essentially the influence of worldliness. And, you know, the Bible says the whole world is under the sway of the wicked one. The influence of, of the moral decline that we see all around us in our culture on the church itself, mm -hmm. how that you know it's kind of crossed a line and it's it's no longer a, you know, a 
Christian uh, church that is standing alone or standing in opposition to or distinct from the world, it, it it's hard to know anymore where worldliness ends mm-hmm. and the church begins. Mm. So, uh, you know, we're talking about essentially an apostate church that the Bible predicts is going to happen in 1 Timothy 4.1. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, one of, one of our passions, our driving passions here at NBW Ministries is the clarity, accuracy, and urgency of the gospel. That is, after all, what matters most. And so in this presentation in Tulsa, after kind of giving all kinds of examples of, of the end times apostasy, I'm going to kind of target uh, seven false gospels that are so prevalent uh, within uh, you know evangelical Christianity today, and and call them out. Hmm. Sounds very engaging. I when I first heard Christian industrial complex, or sometimes it's called the evangelical industrial complex, I really didn't even have to look that up. I just mm-hmm. knew what it was because of all the changes I've seen in the church since I got saved in the early 80s. And it's not just a low view of the Bible, it's an elevated view of man at the same time. It's a, it's a lack of proper fear of God. Um, You know, I, I, I just can't imagine wanting to sign up for that anytime soon. But it's also there's a clash of worldviews, JB, because um, Christians need to understand that there are secular worldly worldviews, um, competing ideologies that eventually will end up in the dustbin of deception, but competing worldviews within the church Wow, I never thought I'd see that. Well, creation, for instance, is a contentious subject in the church. Young Earth, gap theory, was there really a global flood? Um, I know you talked to with Russ about that. Tell us a little bit about um, how in the world uh, the view of creation, when we have Genesis, I mean, we have it, you know, it's an open book test, JB. Um, how hard can it be? But how, how that is a, a, also a clash within the church. Yeah, it's uh, it's amazing. You know, it, it all it wasn't always this way. You go back to the rise of higher criticism, the late nineteenth century, and that's where everything mm-hmm. changed. I mean, that the more I study this stuff, the more I I always come back to the to the year nineteen hundred. You know, that's mm-hmm. really when the Luciferians on Earth made a concerted effort uh, to just really change everything. And so, you know, when we talk about some of these uh, doctrines like Young Earth and literal twenty four hour day, six day creation. Um, you know, you got to you got to think that for roughly 16, 17, 1800 years, this wasn't even on anybody's mind. It was mm. a given. It was just taken for granted that the Bible means what it says. And then all of a sudden, uh, Satan crept in, and uh, we got too smart for our own good. And so, <laughs> you know, all of these Bible schools and seminaries started teaching other views, and and it became the accepted view to you know today, such that now when you actually stand up and speak about the fact that, you know, God spoke the world into existence roughly 6,000 years ago. People look at you like you're from Mars. And and I just want to go, you know, look, it, it's, you know, it's you guys that have uh, come up with a novel view. It, it's almost like uh, so many other things, like uh, compulsory government schooling. You know, mm-hmm. when I when I stand up and speak about and homeschooling and educating your children yourself rather than, you know, subcontracting that out to a pagan institution. Yeah. People look at me like I'm nuts and think, well, well, it's always been this way. And I want to go, no, do your history. We didn't have compulsory government schooling in every state until 1918. So wow. uh, for basically, again, 1800 years, uh, at least in, in uh, church history, uh, people were quite content to raise their children on their own. So uh, it's it's amazing how quickly uh, things become the accepted norm. In fact, you know, one other little anecdote, having been in ministry now for 35 plus years and pastored a few churches along the way, you can always tell when you've been, when you've kind of crossed a threshold in your tenure as a pastor, when things that you implemented, uh, you know, you then later try to tweak a little bit and change mm-hmm. And your your congregation goes well. It's always been that way, and you just have to laugh and go, "No, it hasn't. I started it three years ago, and you never did it before." <laughs> yeah. So it, the people so quickly adopt, you know, whatever they're doing and assume it's always been that way. Mm. Uh, I want to also just take this definition of this evangelical industrial complex a little farther, and I think of the word influencer. Young people, you know, that's a fairly recent buzzword, but I think it kind of applies here, um, viewing social media as an opportunity to be someone who leads the way in influencing people's tastes in music, clothing, lifestyles, nothing of eternal value, of course, at that point. But this is kind of how I view a lot of what goes on in the church, uh, because there is a subset of industries in this industrial complex. There's there's the books, and the books that um, 
pastors and preachers use as their uh, foundation for their Sunday sermons. They'll go through a book. I never heard of such a thing until recently. Um, Christian publishers being bought out by secular publishers. You know, Harper Collins buys out Thomas Nelson. The Prayer of Jabez sold 9.2 million copies. The Left Behind series, 62 million copies. Purpose Driven Life, at one time it sold a million copies a month at the beginning of this century. And um, so there's the celebrity machine uh, who I think, that, here's what I think they tell themselves, that they're a conglomeration of ministries working together to further the gospel. But JB, I'm not so sure that that's true. Uh, is that a little bit of delusion on their part? Yeah, no question. I can remember back during uh, the, the prime time of uh, Purpose Driven Church, uh, Rick Warren's book, uh, I was traveling a lot back then as well, speaking at conferences, and I was running a, a small ministry on the side in addition to uh, Not By Works, which had just gotten started. And I remember thinking profoundly one day as I was walking down the aisle of a plane trying to find my seat, and I happened to pass three different people that were reading Purpose Driven Life. That's how popular it was. And I remember thinking at the time, you know, if people would read the Bible the way they're reading Purpose Driven yeah. Life, it would change the world overnight, mm -hmm. you know, because it's the Bible that's quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. As Howard Hendricks says when you were said, when you re read the Bible, it's doing something to you. Uh, when you read Purpose Driven Life, you're doing something to it. And so, mm. yeah, you know, I get emails all the time. You probably do too from people saying, hey, we're going to start a new Bible study uh, on such and such. Uh, can you recommend a good book? And Every time mm. I just have to graciously say, well, yeah, um, have you considered the Bible? I mean, that, that's, a, that's a good book wow. when you're doing a Bible study, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it sure is. It's, it's, it's the one. It is the human handbook. And then we also have uh, entertainment falls into this, you know, Christian TV, and I'm talking about the TBNs and a lot of those kind of things. A pulpit, entertainment from the pulpit, worship as entertainment, celebrity pastors, um, you know, Osteen, Rick, Rick Warren, Mark Driscoll, those types. Uh, and people reason like this, I think, in this celebrity-laden culture. They must be, these guys must be the most godly, gifted, and smartest pastors, or their church wouldn't be so big, their books wouldn't be bestsellers. So we don't need to test the spirits, First John 4. <laughs> uh, but of course we do, but people just, they, they look at it from such a humanistic perspective. And, and that's my take on why they're not testing the spirits. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's the theme verse for my last uh, book, uh, Spirit of the False Prophet, Rise of the Global mm -hmm. Technocracy, 1 John 4, 1. Many false prophets have gone out in the world, therefore we need to test the test the Spirit. So, yeah, I think, uh, you know, certainly it's possible for God to bless a genuine, sincere ministry that is faithfully mm -hmm following the word and, yep. and, 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 you know, it, it, the Bible says, if you remain faithful in what you've been given, God will increase that stewardship. He'll make you faithful over much, but it's certainly the exception, not the rule. Um, today, you know, and, and a big part, as you've kind of alluded to, of the in, uh, Christian industrial complex is money. Today, if you have the right backers uh, and, and enough money, you can blossom a ministry into thousands, if not tens of thousands, almost overnight. It's, it's yeah. a marketing plan, really. Wow. And um, somewhere along the way, and I don't want to paint with too broad of a brush, but some of the, somewhere along the way, these pastors, they lose their way. They become uh, inevitably impacted by the pressures and stresses of their controllers, their handlers. Yeah. Um, I mean, look at Joel Osteen, perfect example. You know, his father, John, started that uh, ministry. Uh, he was uh, one time a Baptist preacher, then became charismatic. Um other than some doctrinal errors, he was, I believe, early on a genuine guy. He may have been wrong, but yeah. he truly loved the Lord. Yeah. Uh, but as that ministry grew, and then he suddenly died, uh, the handlers, the real power brokers behind Lakewood Church, literally handpicked Joel Osteen. You can read all about this. Uh, he had never been in a pulpit one time in his life, never delivered a sermon, had absolutely zero formal training. He was working in the audio-video ministry, kind of behind a camera. But because he was, uh, uh, you know, fairly good looking and, and likable kind of a guy, and he was the son of the founder, uh, they handpicked him to become the heir apparent. And uh, then they, they managed him. And that's what they've done. Now, uh, he's become the most popular, well-known name within evangelicalism. Uh, in America, if not the world, whenever there's a need for a spokesman or someone to speak for Christians, yeah. He's the guy that you know CNN, Fox News, and all these channels get. Uh, when in reality, 
Uh, he may be a nice guy, but he has next to no knowledge about the Bible, and he does not connect the dots accurately when it comes to, to sound doctrine. Yeah. Well, and leaving off sound doctrine, and then there's the heaps of teachers that people accumulate, uh, will say things they want to hear. If that isn't one of the most spot-on prophecies of our time, I can't think of any more uh, perfect for the, you know for the day than that. But I want to mention also a gentleman like, named Peter Drucker. Now, he was a management guru. He is quoted as saying this about churches, who are the customers and what do they value? Well, he didn't put theology on the list. He thought that was the boring part of church. And so then we had the seeker movement and pragmatism from him. And then he had a guru named Bob Buford, management coach, driving force, who promoted and popularized the purpose-driven paradigm by financing the seminars. He threw all the money at that and the training. And they claimed 30,000 pastors you know, went on to make purpose-driven and Willow Creek models their own, hoping for the same success. So, JB, if you throw enough money at something, uh, it can have incredible consequences in the church. Oh yeah, no, no doubt. I mean, again, it's it's uh, if if you want to do something in the flesh and in in of your own will, you mm-hmm. can do it. I, I can remember when I was in academia for twelve years teaching at the college and graduate levels. Uh, I planted a church with a student. Uh, that uh, church and that student are still going strong uh, today. But when we started it, we got off to a rough start because mm-hmm. a mega church in the Houston area uh, decided uh, they would pop up right down the road from us. And they had a benefactor that provided half a million dollars, seed money, they called it, to buy land, put up a building, and uh, market and advertise on billboards, I mean, expensive billboards on major highways. And, you know, their opening Sunday, they had 5,000 people there, something in that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And they were constantly doing mass marketing campaigns like free giveaways, you know, come this Sunday, we're going to give away a a car, you know, that kind of a thing. (laughs) And so, uh, it, it, you know, we were looking at each other thinking, man, we're just humble servants sitting here trying to preach the Word of God to 30, 40, 50 people every Sunday. And you know, we really would like to grow. We'd like to reach our community for Christ. But it's like everybody, you know, it's like a vacuum is just, they're, they're just flocking to this new big thing with the, it's like a car dealership with the big flags yeah, out there yeah. waving and, and the clowns mm-hmm. and those funny things you put on the corner, the air machines that make the little figures blow mm-hmm. all over the place and attract attention. And it's like, it truly is an example of not all that glitters is gold. Yeah. I mean, uh, Satan likes to masquerade as an angel of light. Yeah. And and the leadership within the church, whenever I hear evangelical leaders say, I tend to stop up my ears because I don't think that's a biblical office. And, and if you are going to listen, you better have discernment because they don't, they don't always say things that we need to hear. And I also think of this little uh, child's rhyme, you know, uh, this little church went to market, this little church stayed home. I mean, I feel like I need to finish that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean. You know, uh, anyway, anyway I, I just wanted to, you know, get your thoughts on that industrial complex. And I do want to make time uh, to talk about uh, these these false gospels um, that are in the church. And I think you have a list of false gospels. Uh, tell us what some of those are. I, I'm very interested in what you have to say about that. Yeah, so uh, as we've said, NBW Ministry stands for Not By Works. It really is our passion. And in the last 15 years, we've gotten heavily into Bible prophecy, which was also a a passion of mine from early on back to my high school days. Uh, But there's really a convergence of clarity of the gospel with the eschatology, because Mm -hmm. obviously the the rapture is imminent, could happen at any time, and we want to get the gospel out there so people aren't left behind. But uh, my first book ever, 20 years ago, first of 13 now, was called Getting the Gospel Wrong, and it actually was Mm -hmm. a reworking of my PhD dissertation, uh, and uh, it exposed several false gospels. um, And then and as time went on, that was in 2007, in 2012 or 13, I think it was, it was republished in a second edition with a new chapter because, uh, you know, already new false gospels had popped up. And then just recently, actually last month in April, it was published in a third edition with yet another chapter. So there are now seven false gospels that I address in there, I think 13 chapters overall. Um, But uh, they're all broad categories of really clear errors when it comes to the gospel. So, for example, we talk about the purpose gospel in there, which you and I have already touched on uh, this morning. Uh, You know, it's not just about Rick Warren, but obviously he's a key name when you think about that. Mm -hmm. But the idea behind the purpose gospel is, is it here and now or then and there? Are Mm. we focusing our message 
only on the present uh, and feeling better and finding purpose and comfort in life. Uh, it underemphasizes sin, and it completely ignores the eternal aspect of the penalty of sin. They don't like to talk about hell, mm-hmm. you know. Um, so that's just one of them. We give lots of examples in the book. The book, by the way, is called Getting the Gospel Wrong, The Evangelical Crisis No One Is Talking About, third edition. Again, it just came out last month. But then we get into, for example, the puzzling gospel. Um, and this one, if we're honest, is one that all of us uh, uh, need to be aware of, because I think in some t- cases, people that are promoting a puzzling gospel mean well. They're They're not you know, doctrinally heretics. They're Mm -hmm. just using language that is confusing or unclear or more traditional rather than, you know, what does the Bible say? So they'll, Mm -hmm. you know, they'll say things like invite Jesus into your heart, which of course is nowhere found in scripture. I, Mm -hmm. I did a deep dive into that for this book and discovered that the phrase never even existed until the early 20th century in Baptist circles. Uh, and it's kind of become sort of a shorthand, for the gospel, but mm-hmm. it, what does it really mean? I mean, why not use the biblical language? 160 times the New Testament says you are saved by believing in Jesus Christ and Him alone. So why not use the word faith, you know, instead of uh, these code words like invite Jesus into your heart? So the puzzling gospel is one of them. Obviously, we spend a lot of time on the prosperity gospel. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's uh, kind of yeah. goes hand in glove with this whole Christian industrial complex we've yeah. been talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, money, health, wealth, that kind of thing. Yeah, the self-gospel, which I think is a subset, too, under the purpose gospel. The self-gospel is probably a subset under all of these. But I was thinking about purpose, too, maybe a political subset would be dominion theology, because that's all over. um, You know, that certainly has never died away. I mean, it sort of seemed like it was coming to the fore in the 90s, and then you didn't hear as much, and now it's back again. Uh, yeah. would, would you say that that is is part of a, a of a political kind of gospel? Oh, very much. Uh, yeah, po- political would be probably another one. Now, now, see, now I've got to write a fourth edition. You've already <laughs> you've already given me more work, and we've only been on for half an hour, Mary. Um, no, uh, yeah, that's I think, but I think it also kind of does go with the purpose gospel in the sense that it's focused on the here and now. It's mm-hmm. all about. To, to building a kingdom now and so forth. I, I had Strat Goodhue on recently. We talked about how NAR is DOA and, and why it's biblically unsound. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, another example of just blatant apostasy and departure from the church as it relates specifically to the gospel. Um, uh, have you heard of uh, Angela de la Cruz? She was in the news a few, few years ago, still gets a lot of publicity, but she and her husband pastor a, a church in uh, San Diego, Living Faith Church. Are you familiar with no, this story? No, uh, I'm not, no. All right, unbelievable. I'm going to be talking about this in uh, uh, Tulsa, uh, but their church, uh, you're going to think I'm making this up, but I've <laughs> vetted it. It's all over the internet. They've done the interviews. I'm going to play a clip of their interview. Um, they, Their church, is, their tagline is a church for sinners by sinners, and uh, Angela De La Cruz and her husband, Stephen, are the co-pastors, and they started the church in 2020, but it's thriving and growing by leaps and bounds now. And their, their, their uh, hook, if you will, is on Sundays, Angela is in the pulpit with her husband preaching and leading worship, but during the week, she's a porn star. And uh, so they, they've decided to lean into that oh, wow. and own it and, and, and come right out and admit, hey, yeah, I'm a porn star, but you want to see, you know, what, what, you know, how I can make this work for us, come to our church. Uh, you know, it's wow. a church for sinners, by sinners. And, uh, and of course, you know, they, 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 they actually had a, a marketing campaign. They're actually, you know, opening uh, here coming up with a, they've done a b- bunch of, um, uh, kind of lead up and preparing the way now they're they're oh. really leaning into it and marketing it and and they said uh, mm. uh we we're promoting this as a coming out event and a chance to peek behind the curtain Ugh. of our church well listen oh, yeah. mary i don't think we want to peek i don't, don't want to peek curtain. behind that curtain no yeah. no thank you anyway I mean, <laughs> I mean, it, it would be like <laughs> alcoholics anonymous yeah. opening a bar yeah, right. by alcoholics and for alcohol wow right? so the moral relativism gospel that's a crazy story you're right i wouldn't believe it if i hadn't if you hadn't looked it up uh we're talking to jb hickson today not by works.org the sun may be shining right now in wisconsin 
But now until July, inside the Rush Center, it's blizzard season. Hand off to Terrence Smith to the goal line. Touchdown, Green Bay. The Green Bay Blizzard are an indoor football team that plays in the IFL and are now excited to become a business underwriter of the Q90FM ministry. Loading up and throwing deep. And this ball is caught for a touchdown. Game schedules and more information can be found at GreenBayBlizzard.com. Green Bay Blizzard, supporting Q90FM. Q90FM presents the Police Lights of Christmas, helping over 70 police departments across Wisconsin. Each department is going to leave this night with a box full of thousands of dollars worth of gift cards. Visit lightsofchristmas.us. Police Lights of Christmas, a ministry of Q90FM. Feedback, questions, and topic suggestions are always appreciated. Email us at comments at standupforthetruth.com. Welcome back to Stand Up For The Truth for this Tuesday in May. We are speaking with J.B. Hickson, notbyworks.org. He is going to be speaking this weekend at the Mid-America Prophecy Conference with Bridget Gabriel, Andy Woods, and others. And we're talking today about the two sessions uh, that he will have this weekend. The first one, which we covered in the first half, False Gospels and the Christian Industrial Complex in the Last Days. A very, very interesting subject. And secondly, the New World Order Timetable 2025 and the Blueprint for Global Tyranny. Uh, New World Order timetable. Yeah. You know, JB, I've talked about um, uh, a lot of the, the the tyranny. We've talked about it on, on Stand Up Here, the tyranny that's coming. And it's it's shocking. And we're going to dig a little deeper today. But JB, I've watched a lot of geeky old 50s and 60s sci-fi films, you know, and it isn't for the flashy special effects. But I always note the futuristic year that they supposedly take place. And to get an eyeful of what they think the future is going to be like. It's very entertaining. They're always way off. But, of course, uh, it's never about a future spiritual condition of the world or some age of Aquarius. It's more about technology and, oh, the great achievements of man, a shiny new future of inventions. And that's always fascinated uh, people. So what will 2025 be like from the perspective of 1950 is very entertaining. But the New World Order has been carefully planned and plotted for a few generations And it includes technology as the main accelerant. So many avenues for tyranny. Let's talk about that, JB. Um, uh, Globalists have been emboldened since 2020. There's no question about that. What makes up this blueprint? Get us started here with some of the possibilities of uh, what what that all entails. Yeah, so it's always helpful to kind of know the enemy's playbook, Mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Uh, But one caveat that I always like to give is that uh, God, obviously, is the ultimate arbiter of the timetable, and uh, he's not beholden to anyone or anything. And so when we talk about how the Luciferians are plotting and planning and have a timetable of their own, a roadmap of their own, we're not meaning to imply that somehow uh, this is going to contravene God's plan. So they could be wrong for sure. But mm-hmm. nevertheless, it's helpful to know at least what they think they're trying to roll out. And as I research this, Uh, I discovered that really the decade of the 2020s is a key decade in their plan, and it goes back almost 100 years at least in their literature, their writings, their speeches. They've been plotting and planning this for a long time. And so it's no surprise that uh, 2020 has already seen so many major world-changing events um, and uh, and I believe if uh, if the Lord doesn't come back uh, soon, uh, that we're going to see even more. But yeah, there's a there's a plan in place. Satan he's definitely the author of confusion, and so it's a very messy, complex, often uh, false starts uh, in in terms of their plan. Plus the the Luciferian plan to take over the world, which we read about in Psalm two is not uh, monolithic. It's not like Satan mm-hmm. can just make a decree and it, and it happens. There yeah. are competing agendas, competing elements, uh, uh, people that go off script, people <laughs> that get mad at you know one another, like you mentioned in the opening about the president and foreign minister of Iran that went down in that helicopter and were killed. You know, that, that to me has all the marks of something fishy going on. Mm-hmm. I don't have any inside scoop, but mm-hmm. I've been studying this stuff long enough to know you know, Iran is at the forefront of world events right now. I mean, they literally yeah. bombed for the first time in modern, in the history of modern Israel, bombed Israel directly. Um, they've been funding all of these proxy terrorist groups. Uh, they've been threatening the U.S. and uh, Israel. Uh, so it's it just seems beyond coincidence that all of a sudden their president 
would mm -hmm. go down. Now, could it be mm -hmm. just an organic tragic accident? Sure. Um, but uh, it's just that there's a lot happening. Uh, and when something like that happens, it could be organic, as we said, but it could also be somebody getting mad at somebody else and yeah. saying, I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> and so, uh, but this plan uh, is what we're going to be talking about in my message this uh, weekend in uh, Tulsa, the New World Order timetable, and with particular attention on the year 2025, because that comes up a lot in a lot of interesting ways. It does. It does. And and I, I tend to think that because, uh, and I, I know a lot of us think this, that, that that prophecy turns on Israel. Israel's the time clock. And so God can intervene at any point, and he can take these gentlemen out for their part in October 7th events. Uh, and that's something that cuts across time and time and space and matter as well. So there's so much to consider there. You have some some quotes here from Alice Bailey now. She, uh, she lived from 1880 to 1949, and she wrote a book called uh, Esoteric Psychology. And she says, the inner structure of the World Federation of Nations will eventually be equally well organized with its outer form taking rapid shape by 2025. And she talks about great changes will be seen um, from until 2025 and have increased activity and speed. Um, yeah. you know, she talks about the stage will be set for the re reappearance of the spiritual hierarchy on Earth in physical form. Wow. JB, what is she talking about? Yeah, so Alice Bailey, uh, some of uh, your listeners may know uh, uh, her, about her, but she's the one who started back in the 30s the Lucifer Publishing Company mm -hmm. with her husband, and uh, it's now known as the Lucius Trust. Um, but anyway, she penned over 10,000 pages in 24 books, uh, most of which were uh, pu published posthumously after she died. But in her books, she claims to be channeling a demon named Master DK. These are her her you know um, explanations for what she's writing. And what's interesting is again these books written 1930s, 1940s, um, uh, 15 times in these books she makes reference to the year 2025 mm. and allegedly this demon is telling her that's the pivotal year that's when uh, oh. satan's going to take over the world and ha his man is going to rise to the fore now as i said obviously you know satan's a liar uh, that, that's his native language mm -hmm. his native tongue <laughs> is to lie he can't do anything else and so uh, so given that this was a minion of his that was kind of moving the pen along in Alice Bailey's hand, yeah. we 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 don't want to put too much stock in it. Right. But it is interesting how much how many people have kind of hung on that. Colleagues and other global elites and Luciferian elites and leaders of the world have really put a lot of eggs in the basket of the 2020s with uh, Agenda 2030 uh, and a number of other um, world changing events. And so you got guys like Klaus Schwab out there who. Uh, who's in his 80s, and uh, he thinks the, the one world system is so close he can practically taste it, and he really wants to make sure they cross the finish line of this one world political, religious, and economic uh, system before he dies. And so they're, they're hard at work. It's pedal to the metal for these guys. Yeah. And uh, again, we don't know, the only timetable that matters is God's, and you know, he may decide, hey, we want another 50 years for people to come to faith. Remember, for Second Peter 3, 9, God is not willing that any should mm -hmm. perish, but that all come to repentance. So, uh, you know, we, but we certainly know that they're striving hard uh, to bring this to culmination here in the very near future. They are indeed. And, and when you think about it, as I thought about this subject, avenues for tyranny, um, manufactured crises, and there are just a few that I thought of in a space of 60 seconds, viruses, elections, cyber crises, power grid failures, paid agents, you know, general malcontents in general to stir up protests, border chaos, you know, destroying America from within, which takes many different forms, um, disarming people, disbanding law enforcement, lockdowns, black swans, false flags, <laughs> JP, they just, it's, it's as though they're saying, well, if one of the two don't, don't work, if, if one or two of those don't work, we've got 10 more. Yeah. Yeah. They're throwing it all up there for sure. Coming at it from multiple angles. Uh, and I do think it's going to be a cumulative uh, case of mm. when they, when the push finally comes to shove and they want to bring down America, it's not going to be any one thing. They're going to, 
they're going to come at it from a few angles. Um, I talk about the America problem a lot in my writings, which is uh, something that, again, goes back to the early 1900s uh, when the Luciferian global elites really decided that the only way they were going to be able to achieve their goal of world domination and the new world order was by getting rid of America. It was the one nation standing in the way. And so that's when they set in motion a lot of the things that we're bearing the fruits of today, moral decline, utter chaos, breakdown of the family, the gender surrender movement, all of these things that they were really plotted and planned early on. And it takes a while. It I does. Mean, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, that's 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 where we're headed for sure. Yeah, it takes a couple generations at least um, for a lot of these moral things, to for moral decay to, to set in the, the serious rot. Um, it takes time. Uh, so you're right about that. Um, viruses, you know, virus X or disease X, what are they talking about? They're talking about the bird flu. So many different ways we can get that. Um, gain of function experiments. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's on the horizon between in the for the next year or so. Do you have any more thoughts on that particular um, manufactured crisis? <laughs> Yeah, I do. I, I feel like uh, it's one of their favorites. I think in, in uh, we've seen it again and again. We see the exercises that they try to do to kind of plan for it and prepare for it. But one comment I will make about that, which, uh, you know, I, I, I'm not the only one saying this, but I'm, I'm in the vast minority. A lot of people are out there suggesting that uh, we won't be duped again. Mm -hmm. That uh, people have awakened to the just some of the nonsense that, that went on uh let's just say around 2020, trying to choose my words carefully yeah, here. Right. Uh, uh, and so, uh, oh, they'll never fool us again is the idea. I'm not so sure mm -hmm. about that, honestly. I never underestimate, underestimate the stupidity of the American people and the power of fear. Yes. All they have to do is ratchet up the fear a few notches and uh, people will cower. And uh, so I do look for them to use some type of uh, a pandemic, real or synthetic, uh, and uh, and use that as a, a tool to, of enslavement, for sure. Wow. Yes, I agree with that completely, ratcheting up the fear. All they got to do is say one out of every four Americans will die from this, and that's it. That's going to be all yeah. she wrote, um, because they know exactly where you know where to shoot at the heart of the average person. It's, it's, a, it's a mental war. It's a psychology war, that sort of thing. So, And then there's black swan events, false flag events that we don't even foresee, um, the rapture of the church, boy, wouldn't that throw the world into a tizzy? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm going to be talking about that at the uh, Watchers Weekend Colorado at the end of June. I've got a message on one minute after the rapture, the day the world mm. changed forever. Mm. And uh, we're going to talk about the chaos that ensues. Uh, but yeah, the, the a Black Swan event, I think that's a, a big part of it. But I think uh, it's going to be manufactured. I mean, we know that they use false flags and stand down events and orders uh, uh, as a tool of war and have for centuries. I mean, it goes back to 1600s. Uh, this is a common technique. It's still taught in the American War College today, mm -hmm. uh, where you need to get support for something. And so you you stage an attack, blame it on your enemy. And then everybody says, we got to go get that enemy, right? I mean, this is exactly what happened with the Gulf of Tonkin incident. We now know that that never happened. Uh, it's, it's on record. The Congress has you know, talked about it, uh, the uh, Freedom of Information Act uh, documents and actually documents that were classified for 50 years, but eventually the time limit ran out and they released them. We now know that the Gulf of Tonkin incident was completely mm -hmm. made up, and yet it was what was used to get us into the Vietnam War that cost the lives of 58,000 American servicemen and women. Sometimes I think there's a hat out there with all these different avenues for tyranny and crises, and they just pull three and, and just... Combine them. If you combine any two or three of these, you have absolute disaster. Uh, the yeah. election, I know people are talking. At, well, I've heard some chatter that Biden may just need to pull out, that he may not end up running at all at this point because uh, because he's perceived as just beyond weak. Do you think that's a possibility at this point or are we stuck with the Trump Biden thing? I think anything's possible at this point. Yeah. I, I can't even begin to, to figure out. To me, it's it's like a riveting movie and a, an incredible <laughs> screenplay and, and script, uh, which it is all theater. Let's just be clear about yeah. that. Uh, but it's fun. It's fun to watch. And I have no idea whether they are going to put Trump in there or they're going to put Biden in there or one is going to drop out or both are going to drop out or not be eligible. Who knows? Mm -hmm. It's just 
Amazing. And and my friend Randy Alv often likes to say uh, he still contends in his speculation that the next U.S. president is going to be wearing a uniform. In other words, you know, we won't have an election. We'll end up being an under martial law wow. because of some world changing event. And and let me just interject, Mary, the, the, the reason the New World Order timetable matters above all else is because of the urgency of the hour. Mm-hmm. Again, we don't know when these things are going to uh, to happen. It seems like it's advancing very, very rapidly. Change AI technology, the, the global technocracy that I write about in my latest book. It's overwhelming how fast things are changing. So the urgency of it is what it's all about. And if, if someone's listening to this program, turn, turn the dial, stumbled upon, stand up for the truth, and you don't know the Lord, that's what matters most. Uh, you don't want to be left behind. If the rapture were to happen today, things are going to just be unlike any time in human history after the rapture on earth. And you don't want to be facing the deception that's going to reach unprecedented heights at that point. You want to place your faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God who died and rose again for your sins today. Today is the day of salvation. So I hope folks will take that seriously and recognize their sin and their need for a Savior and come to faith in Christ. Yeah. Yeah, well put, JB. And with all those false false, false gospels out there, we lose um, we lose the urgency of the gospel. And um, we need to the church needs to ramp up the urgency. And um, there are there's persecution all over the world. People that understand that better than the West does how important it is to to lay down everything for the sake of the gospel. That's the hill we're supposed to die on, not politics mm-hmm. or anything like that. Um, yeah, and it's it's ironic, Mary, that at a time when the world needs the gospel more than ever before urgency of the hour, the -hmm. church is preaching the pure gospel less and less. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I mean, it's just, it's amazing. It's, this ought to be the time when the church shines. You know, we have the answer. We know who paid our sin debt. We know uh, the path to eternal life and peace with God. And yet uh, the church has fallen down on the job. Yes. Agreed. Let's uh, talk about the digital ID, because I think we've been following technology for a long time, unsure of what form um, the Mark of the Beast might take. And we're not there yet, obviously, and that'll be compulsory at at some point. But um, let's talk about a digital ID. It's something that comes with an on-off switch. But I like to walk backwards on these things. What problems did the globalists invent, which seemingly make a digital ID the only solution, right? Uh, Aesop said, the tyrant will always find a pretext for his tyranny. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the the problem was we've got this virus that we need to make sure everybody's mm-hmm. uh, vaccinated and uh, not going to kill their neighbor or kill grandma. So we've got to track everybody. And so that was part of it. Uh, part of it is, uh, I think, the, by the way, the digital ID and the digital currency, of course, go hand in glove. And so part of it's going to be the uh, collapse of the economy, uh, that if we'd have had a digital economy, this wouldn't have happened. Or now mm-hmm. that it's happened, let's rebuild it, but let's do it the right way. Instead of giving you control of your own means of exchange, we're going to have completely controllable money that, as you said, can be turned on and off. Uh, so yeah, there's always a pretext. Uh, in the case of digital currency, it's a the convenience. You know, it's uh, this. Think about how much more convenient your life will be if you don't have to carry a wallet, you don't have to carry cash, you don't have to go to the bank, uh, you don't have to deal with your portfolio. You've just got yeah. one little card or app on your phone, or in some cases, implantable chips. Some parts of the world are already using that type of technology, uh, and it's all tied together. And you can go anywhere in the world and wave your hand and make a purchase. Wow. Well, and it's tied into uh, cyber currency, too, digital currency, um, mm-hmm. you know, passwords being a thing of the past. I, JB, I can't come up with one more password. I'm sorry. The well is dry over here. I just can't come up with one more password that works. Yeah. Well, what frustrates me is this whole zero trust concept that I talk about in my book, The Rise of the Global Technocracy. You know, they, they claim they're doing it for our own good, but when they mean zero trust, they mean they don't trust you either. <laughs> so you have to prove that you're you, and it's only a small, small step from having to prove that you're you so that someone can't steal your stuff yeah. to having to prove that you've behaved. Do you have mm-hmm. the right social credit score? Do you have the right carbon footprint? Did you use too much water? Did you eat too much sugar? Uh, and then uh, if you can't measure up, then they don't trust you. And so um, passwords are not 
an issue for me because I've got a, a encrypted password safe, but that, that's not enough anymore. Nowadays, they make you have these two-factor authentication, and you got to answer all these questions, and you got to jump through a thousand hoops, and you're sitting here going, look, I'm really me, and this really is my bank account. Can I please have access to it? I don't have 10 minutes to convince you that I'm really me. Yeah. And so they've, they've, once again, it's the pretext concept. They've convinced us that it's for our own good. It's not for our own good. Mm -hmm. um, we don't need a nanny state that's going to watch out for us. If you're not smart enough to keep your technology safe, then you deserve to be hacked, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but I certainly don't want to trust my government to protect me from bad guys because they'll, in a dime, in an instant, they'll turn that technology on me and cause me to be locked out of my own belongings. Yeah. And at some point, I know they want you to think that this is your idea, that, oh, yes, I want this digital ID. You have a quote here, the ideal tyranny is that which is ignorantly self-administered by its victims. The most perfect slaves are, therefore, those which blissfully and un unawaredly enslave themselves. Donald James, I'm not sure who he is. is he yeah, he was a British, uh, okay. uh, you know, uh, famous television writer. He died in 08, but he was a novelist, television personality. Okay. Uh, yeah. Wow. And, and so, you know, if you want your government services, um and they're going to want you to want that. You're going to want the mark. You're going to want this because it's for the best for you and for everyone, especially after the rapture when, when they don't know who's left and you want to say, no, I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. And yeah. uh, this is me and I need to access my bank account. I need my social security. I need all this. So what a mess. What a mess. Yeah, I mean, everybody's out there talking about make America great again. I, I think <laughs> we need to make Orwell fiction again. That's what we need to do. Yeah, yeah. I actually saw a, a, a shirt, a T-shirt with that on it. <laughs> make Orwell yeah. fiction again. I like yep. that. And we're at the point, too, where there are really no more rights, only privileges. You know, when you talk about um, the various amendments, you know, a search and seizure, number four, a freedom of speech, uh, right to bear arms, the, the right to gather, uh, give your opinion. I mean, just ask the, the football player from the Chiefs who said, you know, uh, gals, you're yeah. going to find that one of the greatest things you ever do in life is is having children and being married. And the, and the left lost their minds, JB. Yeah. Yeah, it's unreal. I mean, and, you know, I, I say kudos to him. I mean, I, yeah. that just totally makes me proud. I, I showed my sons that, of course, they'd already seen it. But I'm like, this is this is who you need to be. This is who you want to be. Yeah. I mean, uh, you don't have to agree with him, right. but, to, but he should have the right to say that. And uh, we do happen to agree with him. But to the left, it's like they, they believe in freedom of speech unless you disagree with them. And suddenly they become... Uh, just uh, yeah. apople apoplectic that, 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 that somebody disagreed with them. Well, and they have no idea what the church actually teaches. And so when something comes up like this, they, they, they lose their minds because I didn't know people actually thought like that. Well, there's a lot you don't know how people think because you're an echo chamber in your own head when it comes yeah, to the and plus left, when right? they do want an expert opinion, they go to Joel Osteen or Rick Warren. So they're not getting the right answers. <laughs> well, we've gone full circle here this morning, yes, haven't we? we have. Wow. <laughs> Well, and I think we're also looking at, and I don't know for sure because people have been talking about this for a long time, food shortages, I think, are on the horizon. Um, and it comes down to who owns the world's seeds. I actually did a, a podcast on this last week. Uh, gen genetically modified seeds have given immense power to corporations like Bayer. They own 60% of the world's seeds, other corporations as well. The global seed market is valued at $58 billion in 2023, and it's projected to reach $83 billion by 2028. So now at some point they're going to decide who can plant and harvest, who can use these seeds. And if you don't play by their rules, they will put a farmer oh. out of business. Yeah, they're already there. I mean, yeah. Monsanto, uh, they put all the small farmers out of business. Um, uh, Wendy and I just got back from a conference in uh, South Dakota. And on our drive time, we listened to a lot of health podcast. And we were just really overwhelmed and struck by the fact that it's gotten to be where you really can't get healthy food anymore. No. I mean, you can't even buy, you know, grass-fed beef because if they use pesticides mm -hmm. in the farm next mm -hmm. bot, next door or, you know, the, the, or they're spraying stuff in the air, which we know they're doing with the geoengineering, mm -hmm. uh, even those are going to be contaminated. Yeah. I mean, wh where do you go? They're, they're really tightening the noose, and yeah. which to me is a huge sign of the times. And once again, 
means that if you don't know the Lord, you need to, to place your faith in Christ. Yeah. And if you do know the Lord, you need to stay close to him and abide in him so that uh, whatever happens, you know, you've, you've got, uh, you know, uh, the, the strength of the Lord and his word right mm-hmm. there with you. Amen. We're being humans are being backed into a corner, owning nothing and being happy about it. Well, I'm not so sure about that. But that's his mantra. And JB, um, we are at the end of our time, which is just amazing to me. Um, But you will be at that conference this weekend. How can we pray for you? How can we pray for the ministry and and the audience this weekend? Um, Well, how would you like to take us out here? Yeah, you bet. So, yeah, appreciate the prayers and, and encouragement. Uh, we've got, to, by the way, tonight, for anyone that's interested, we've got a live Q and, a Zoom Q&A oh, with great. Uh, Andy Woods. You can learn about oh, that great. on our website. Um, but pray pray for our travel. We are you know hitting the road like crazy again, uh, June, August, September, October, wow. November, December, oh, wow. every month. So uh, just thankful for the opportunity to to preach the Word of God and teach the Word of God, but uh, certainly pray for strength and safe travels. Yes, we will absolutely do that for you. I thought your travel season was going to kind of wind down, but apparently you, God's giving you a lot of open doors and a lot of things to do. And, and He has. Uh, wow. He has. It will be coast to coast for the rest of the year. Uh, well, so. we really appreciate your ministry. We appreciate all this great wisdom and knowledge that you pass our way. Thanks again for being on with us, JB. Our pleasure. Love, love, stand up for the truth. Thank you guys God very much. God bless you. Yeah. All right, Wednesday, uh, we have a replay of Elisa Childers. She's going to talk about deconstructing the faith. That's, that's uh, worth listening to. And then Jay Warner Wallace on Thursday, uh, we'll be talking with, it, uh, with him. He's an apologist and uh, uh, also looking forward to that. So I hope you will join me uh, for the rest of the week with some great podcasts. And uh, um, we're, gonna, we're just going to wrap this one up. So um, we just appreciate you. We're listener supported and we praise God for every single one of you. Uh, that we can be on the air and speak the truth about so many things that matter. Uh, so thank you so much for joining me and um, have a great day. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I need to hear that sometimes. First Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Have a great day on purpose. And thank you so much for your feedback via email. Comments at standupforthetruth.com. 